Good morning. Well, I enjoyed. So on uh, Tuesday at the uh, soup, uh, which was very delicious, by the way, Ted and Frank and I sat down and had a very lively conversation on the length of last week's sermon. Um, one of them loved the length and thought it was perfect, and the other thought it was too short. So we will see how today goes. Um, I don't know. We'll we'll trust the Lord to lead in that. So um, it was fun, and I enjoyed it. So let's open in prayer. Lord, I thank you for your work uh, in my life um, and your word. Um, and we know that you're the one that gives understanding um, as you continue to guide each and every one of us. And I just ask for wisdom and understanding as we open your word today. I pray these things in your name. Amen. So this week, as I sat down to write this week's sermon, I must confess it, it was a little bit of a uh, challenge. Because every time I sat down to prepare and pray, I just seem to be hit with every kind of distraction and hindrance you can think of. And each day it's like, okay, well, I didn't get anywhere this day. I'll, I'll try again tomorrow. And the next day was the same thing. On one particular morning, while I was trying to focus, one of my roosters was outside my window. And every five to ten seconds would let out this obnoxious call. And I found myself getting anxious annoyed, irritated, irritable, and to make it worse, my wife and my kids could tell I was on edge too. As I was praying, Lord, what do you have me to preach on this week? I would hear that rooster crowing. I found myself thinking about how fortunate Peter must have been to only have to listen to that three times. <laughs> Yet here I am trying to write a sermon, and every time I would start, there'd be that rooster crowing as if mocking me. Now, when I look at the rooster crowing in Peter's life, it served as a reminder of his failure, a reminder that his best to serve the Lord came up short. So here I am trying to prepare a sermon and a rooster crows. Failure. Here I am trying to spend time in my closet praying, Lord, what would you have me preach? And I hear the crow again. And I'm reminded of my failure. And this continued for about 30 minutes. So, of course, after spending time last week looking at Paul's prayer to the Ephesians and making that prayer my own, Lord, give us a spirit of wisdom and a revelation of the knowledge of you. And there goes the rooster. As we've been working through the book of James, I was reminded in chapter 1, Starting in verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Let him ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For the person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. God, I need wisdom right now. What are you trying to teach me? What am I supposed to preach on? And there's the rooster again. And I'm reminded of my failure. The truth is, I am that man described in James when I get tossed by the waves. I am unstable-minded. And the irony is, the harder I try to be stable-minded, the rooster would crow, and I was forced to recognize the more unstable I actually am. So more out of just pure desperation, because I'm going, God, I don't know what you're trying to teach me other than I'm a failure. I continued just reading in Ephesians. So if you want to turn in your Bible to Ephesians, uh, we're going to start uh, actually in chapter 3, verse 14, and we'll go through chapter 4. So starting in verse 14, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit 
in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, and to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Continuing in chapter 4, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up of the body, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every kind of wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, with each part working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you may no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because the ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice of every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Christ, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. <laughs> Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. And do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal. But rather, let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may be something to share with everyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fit for the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So starting back uh, in chapter 3 and verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I don't know about you, but when I find myself failing at the Christian life, there are passages like this that when I read them, I, I feel as though they're a million miles away. God's riches of his glory, Christ dwelling in me, when despite my best efforts, a roost is there to crow 
mock and remind me of my failures as a father, as a husband, as a preacher, as an officer, and as a Christian. Yet it is not my strength, but it is his, as it highlights, strengthened with his power through the Holy Spirit. If this were easy, then I would not need God's strength to live out the Christian life. Continuing in verse 19, And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. I don't know about you, but at least for me, there's something deeply humbling knowing someone loves you when you have absolutely nothing that you can give them back. It is humbling to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. I cannot understand how much God loves me. Now, we may say it, and we know Christ died for us, but when I'm being tossed by the waves, when the rooster crows, when I'm reminded of my shortcomings and how strong the flesh is fighting in my life, I do not understand God's love for me. Yet this is not a love for love's sake, but rather God is working to accomplish his will both in my life and around me according to his power, to him be the glory. This is similar to what we looked at um, last week uh, when we mentioned Romans 11.36. For from him and through him and for him are all things, to him be the glory forever. God strengthening me through the power of the Holy Spirit, dwelling in me, loves me past the point of comprehension, so that despite my failures and shortcomings, he is able to do a work in and through me according to his will, according to his purpose, for his glory, so that there is no denying that God alone is the source of blessing. This is true for us corporately and for each of us individually. So when I see God acting in my life, despite my shortcomings, there is no doubt that it was God at work, and I had nothing to do with it. Continuing on uh, in chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. I find this passage a little ironic. Because a prisoner has no choice, as they're a prisoner. They're told what to do, when to do it, how to do it. So what does it mean when it says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called? Or to put it a little differently, what does it mean to walk a Christian walk in the same way you were called? Let me ask you a question. When someone calls your phone... Who is the initiator and who is the responder in that conversation? The same is true of our Christian walk. Now, we are not lazy bumps on a log, passively doing nothing. However, it does cast a different light on the Christian life. God calls, we respond. Our Christian life is a response to God's initiation in our life. This is the same truth that we see echoed in Colossians 2.6, which says, Therefore, as you've received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. The passage does not say, Now that you've received Christ, go live for him. In the same way, in the same manner, in which you came to Christ in the first place, is the exact same way and ability you have to live the Christian life. Very briefly, Looking at John chapter 3, this is when Nicodemus visited with Christ. Now there is a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, and for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he was old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. We talk about spiritual birth in Christ, and in the same way as physical birth, babies contribute nothing to their birth. This is true in the physical sense, as well as the spiritual. You contributed nothing to your birth in Christ. The first temptation from the devil to Eve was, did God really say? He was getting Eve to doubt God's word. And the devil does the exact same with me, and he does the exact same with the church. So as we see in Colossians and Ephesians, we are told to walk in the Christian life in the same way that we came to Christ in the first place. So then why do I think I have anything to contribute to the Christian life? If my Christian walk is to mirror the reflection of my salvation in Christ, then I contribute nothing. Rather like the phone ringing, it's my job to respond. I may choose to pick up the phone, but I don't know of anybody who bragged or boasted about answering a phone call. The Christian life is not something we accomplish. Rather, it is something we are given. The Christian life is something we receive. Often when I find myself trying to live out the Christian life out of my own self-determination and willpower, that is when I find myself the man described in James. That is when we receive, it is when we receive the Christian life that we are able to, as it says in Ephesians, walk with all humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another in love. Continuing uh, in Ephesians, uh, in verse 11, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. In the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from their life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learn Christ. If you remember the prayer in Ephesians 1, that the Lord give you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of Him. This is a continuation of that. In verse 13, God gave people their spiritual gifts to serve the people for His glory. God invites us to respond to His work in our lives, to accomplish His purpose, so that at the end of it all, we can say, look what God did. When I read this passage, I found it convicting because as much as I don't want to admit it, and in my pride, I act like a child. And if I'm being honest, frankly, there's times I kind of want to. I want to scream, I want to pitch a fit, and I want to get my way. It is so tempting to want to give in to human scheming, and my own craftiness, and my desire to control my circumstances around me, because I want life to go the way that I want it to go. We've all probably seen at times when we've been out in public or shopping at the grocery store, we've seen that child that throws a tantrum and the parent is manipulated and controlled by the child. The child yells, screams, throws a fit, maybe even starts hitting the parent in the leg, and the parent, to simply pacify the child, gives in.
How many times in my life do I behave the same way and I start throwing a fit and a tantrum expecting God to cater to my will? I'm thankful that God in his wisdom and love that surpasses my feeble understanding, he does not give in, but continues to parent me as a good and loving father. The reality is when I'm not walking in the Christian life I receive, but rather I live it as something to attain, that is when I find myself more prone to thinking like a Gentile. I become hard of heart. My mind starts thinking in futility. I start thinking of the Christian life as something I can do, not something I receive. So when God uses a a rooster crowing to remind me of my failures, to remind me of my bad attitude, to remind me of my inability to accomplish the Christian life, Do I in humility return to God to acknowledge my inability to walk in a manner that he has first called me? Or do I let my heart get calloused, as it mentions in verse 19? Continuing in verse 21. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth in Christ, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and this corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as Christ forgave you. So then what is this old self? This old self is my strength, my ability to live my life according to my will for my glory. Putting on the new self is different. Yet how often do we brag about that? I've never heard anyone, if they're in the mall, go to a clothes rack, pick out some clothes, go to the changing room, put on the clothes, and start bragging about how amazing they are at putting new clothes on. Or even bragging about they were the ones that picked out the clothes, the shirt, the dress, whatever it may be. No, rather they spend time admiring the clothes and the effect it has on them. Much like if we think about a new bride about to get married and she often goes and you know is looking for her wedding dress. And when she finally finds the one, I don't know if she ever goes, at least I've never heard or seen it, and starts bragging about her ability to pick a dress or her skills at putting the dress on. No, she simply admires the dress and how she looks in it. And typically that's what others notice too. It's when I find myself struggling like a child being in futile in mind that I start to recognize the problem is me. I was reminded in John 6, 64, when Christ was speaking to his disciples, he said, but there are some of you who do not believe. And I was reminded, God is never surprised by my unbelief. And he's never surprised by my failures. Christ was not surprised by Peter's failure. The only one surprised was Peter himself. And when you think about it, how fatherlike is that? For a little child to think they have it all figured out, and a loving father to lovingly watch as their child grows in understanding, you don't have it all together and you don't understand. We often like to quote in Isaiah 64, and we quote it a lot to non believers about how man's righteousness is as filthy rags. Yet, all too often, we don't apply this to Christian living. When Christ said in John 15, For apart from me, you can do nothing. Do you realize this is not simply an issue of salvation, but also Christian living? This means that apart from Christ, the good that I desire to do for Christ is not attainable unless Christ who dwells in my heart is the originator of it. Remember at creation, it was God who was the one that got to determine if something was good. And why was it good? Because its origin and its very reason for existence were conceived in God. This is no less true in the Christian life. 
To wrap up here, I'd like to read a section from um, Major Thomas, um, who was involved with Torch Bears for Christ. Um, and he wrote the book, Indwelling Life of Christ. Um, and if you get a chance to read it, I'd highly encourage that. Um, but I'd like to close out with this because I think it, it sums up this concept and passage nicely. There is a moment of truth for every human soul to whom the Holy Spirit, through the human spirit, has revealed the wickedness of sin. It is so easy to become familiar with Bible language without receiving any real revelation of truth. God wants to bring you, no matter how bitter may be the experience, to the place of self-discovery, to this moment of truth. In startling reality, the truth as expressed by Paul may dawn upon your soul. I am the creature of the flesh, carnal, unspiritual, having been sold into slavery under the control of sin, Romans 7.14. This passage in Romans reveals how the human soul is exploited by the subtle principle of sin within and clearly defines the conflict within you. One part of you says, I acknowledge and agree that the law is good and that I take side with it. I endorse it and delight in the law of God in my innermost self with my new nature, Romans 7.16. In your human spirit, the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to all that is good and right and noble. And your enlightened moral conscience, every act and attitude of sin, is an offense. Then there is that other part of you, the sin principle which dwells within me, fixed and operating in my soul. Romans 7.20 You realize that when I want to do what is right and good, evil is ever present within me, and I am subject to ins insistent demands. The moment of truth comes when you quit exchanging courtesies with the flesh and repudiate it to its face, naming it for its treacherous, wicked, worthless thing that it is. At this climactic stage in your Christian life, you realize that there can be no compromise with the flesh, and that peaceful coexistence with the principle satanically hostile to the law of God and to the reestablishment of his sovereignty within your soul is now beyond the bounds of possibility. You realize that it was never God's purpose to improve the flesh, to educate it, or to tame it, let alone Christianize it. It has always been God's purpose that the flesh, condemned, sentenced, and crucified with Christ, might be left buried in the tomb and replaced by the resurrection, by the resurrection life of the Lord Jesus himself. The risen Christ must exercise control in your mind, in your emotions, and in your will, expressing himself through your personality. Paul described this very clearly in his concern for the Ephesian Christians when he prayed for them, quote, For this reason I bow my knees for the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit, in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The resurrected Christ living in you so that he can get the glory, not so that I can boast and say, look how great I was at answering a phone call or picking out a new shirt to wear, so that ultimately I'm going, I cannot live this Christian life and the only way I can walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which I've been called is if, like the baby, recognizing I contribute nothing to my Christian life. And so then in humility, like that child, coming to the Father and going, I can't do this, but you can. Let's close in prayer. Lord, I thank you for your patience with me. Um, Despite like a child when I throw a tantrum in a fit and I want to be able to accomplish my will according to my plans and my ability, that you continue to love me and guide me. And I thank you that it's not my ability, but it is yours. Mm -hmm. So that in the end, <laughs> there's no denying that you are the Lord and you are God and you are the one on your throne. I thank you that you're with us and I thank you for your word. Put these things in your name. Amen.